So hello and welcome to another Renegade Economist talk show. This week I'm joined by Matthew Watson. He's a professor of political economy in the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Warwick. Matthew, uh, thank you for coming. Thank, thank you for making the trip down to Warwick. Well, from thank Warwick. you for the invitation. Uh, and um, let's start, um, it's apt for us to start, by talking a little bit about the state of economics and teaching economics in academia at the moment. Um, as a professor, what's your view of where we're at uh, teaching the dismal science? Um, well, the dismal science thrives. Um, it's certainly not short of students wanting to study it uh, at every level. So from uh, beginning undergraduates all the way through to PhD students, uh, there's a constant clamour for people to have uh, an economics degree. Um, so at that level, it's in rude health. I think there's some interesting developments going on within economics, though. The more and more that economists themselves begin to reflect upon um, what they teach, how their discipline is moving forward, um, the more pressure there seems to be for a, a slightly more rounded conception of what economics is. Now I only look in uh, on my economist colleagues as an outsider because I work in a politics department uh, but at the same time I think it's it's still clearly visible that there are these movements afoot. There are uh, concerns about the uh, breadth of uh, economics modules, there are concerns more generally about the breadth of economics uh, curricula uh, and the question of what it means to be a good economist, does that translate into what students need to know uh, and how students might be able to use economic knowledge uh, in the future in their life. The neoclassical economic paradigm um, is a, uh, let's say, an ideology that has very little to do with the real world. Um, and that's an understatement. And students slowly are starting to come to the realisation that this type of teaching isn't going to serve them, uh, let's say, fully in the real world, having paid an awful lot of money for that. Uh, education. What's your view on that? Uh, I think students are coming to that realisation. Uh, we were talking uh, before about an incident that's recently happened at Harvard University where the, uh, where the writer of the best-selling textbook in, in economics, uh, Greg uh, Mank um, he experienced a walkout amongst some of his students who handed him an open letter complaining about uh, the narrowness of what they were being taught. Uh, complaining about the partiality in both senses of the term of what they were being taught. They were being instructed to view the world through an economist toolkit that allowed them to see only very small parts of it uh, and that structured them into uh, particular types of interpretation of what that world was about. But at the same time, students come to university for more than purely intellectual reasons. Um, many of them treat it primarily uh, simply as a means of getting themselves to where they want to be on a career ladder. Uh, if education is simply a signal uh, to potential employers, uh, a lot of students like the signal uh, to be sent to potential employers that what they're particularly good at is an abstract form of economic analysis <laughs> that might not tell them anything about the real world, right. uh, but might help them to become uh, employable, might help them to become particularly useful doing particular types of jobs in particular sectors of the economy. Mm. Um, a lot of the uh, major employers of economics uh, graduates, uh, certainly in this country, have relationships with uh, city firms of one sort or another. And for any student that aspires to go and work in those firms with the uh, financial rewards uh, that accompany that type of work, then a, a, an orthodox neoclassical economics education is exactly maybe is the thing for them to have. Not quite. Um, so but, but so it, you've got different sorts of e yeah. economics now and different sorts of students, and it's all going into a bit of a mishmash. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure uh, what's going to come uh, out of the other side, because we've gone for, oh, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years of this uh, increasing narrowing and narrowing and narrowing of economics yes. until you get to this uh, solid neoclassical core. But now there are reasons, I think, to be thinking beyond that, even for the economists themselves. And a lot of economists are more than willing um, to look in cognate areas to see um, what they can learn from uh, anthropological studies, from sociological mm. studies, in particular from uh, psychology, the whole behavioural economics movement. In some uh, universities and in some areas uh, and in some of the curricula that students are taught, Behavioural economics might now be the core. It's not what they get taught first. 
So it's always taught after they learn the intellectual core of neoclassical economics, uh, but it might account for more of the curriculum that they experience now. So there are interesting things going on. That's quite exciting, isn't it? Because otherwise you just have this stale status quo that keeps perpetuating the same students and it's almost a unikit student who has, a, you know, does PPE, comes out, goes and gets a job, goes to the city, leaves the city, goes to politics. And the difficulty is, and as we see now with the front bench um, in, this, in the UK, is that a lot of the guys who've done those economics courses are only half equipped. Hmm. So when they come to deal with a real world problem, they don't have the wherewithal to actually um, uh, get, get to grips with it and then solve it. Because hmm. um, their thinking has been, uh, their mind's been bent in a way. There's an important distinction here. The distinction is between knowledge of the economy and economics. Now, economics is one way to generate knowledge about the economy, yeah. uh, but it's only one way in amongst many, many others. Um, and so economics is a language uh, and a method uh, and a set of analytical tools. Right. And it's not really anything more than that. Uh, economics, once upon a time, used to be defined in terms of its subject matter uh, and progressively, um, really from the 1930s onwards, became to be defined solely in terms of a method. Um, what in the 1930s increasingly got called the science of choice. Mm -hmm. So it's about... Uh, imagining optimization uh, games uh, that were played by individuals in the first instance and then by groups of individuals in more complicated models. Uh, and the question was simply, uh, how do those people uh, eliminate random factors from their choices so their choice can lead towards an equilibrium structure that the model already has? And so that's what the core of neoclassical economics mm. is. It, it's the science of choice, to use the old-fashioned description of it. Um, where what is allowed to influence that choice is heavily circumscribed, um, stripped down to this uh, fallacious conception of uh, economic man, uh, the fabled homo economicus. Rational. Uh, rational, yes. We're all yes, totally rational, rational right? uh, economic Never man. once has anyone made an irrational decision in the eyes of the... In, in, economy. in some of the more complex models now, uh, possibly, but there are always rational explanations for why those irrational decisions <laughs> would take. Um, when we were, just to give context to this, we were up at um, Warwick University screening Four Horsemen, the film, and in the Q&A afterwards, one of the things that you said which stuck, really stuck out was this um, Greg uh, Mankiw wrote this textbook, and on one of the pages he says, I'm talking about intuition specifically here, I want you to park your intuition to right. a student. I want you to start thinking not like a human being thinks, but like an economist thinks. Yeah. And you said that, can you just talk a bit about that? Because, I mean, that sentence to me jumped out, you know, don't think like, as you would intuitively, start thinking like this, well, it's got kind of brainwash written all over. Right. Uh, it's, it's the best-selling textbook in economics, it's called Principles of Economics, I think. Uh, over the years, every best-selling book in the whole history of political economy has had the word principles in there somewhere. <laughs> um, so this is Principles of Economics. Um, it's gone through oh, any number of editions now, um, apparently sold well into the millions uh, of copies. So it's an incredibly important text because it, it is the text that most students learn their economics from. Uh, and there is this passage early in the book um, which is imploring the students not to get too, not to get too rattled, not to get too disturbed by uh, the sorts of exemplars that they're going to be introduced to early on, uh, because uh, Mankiw uh, suggests to them that they're going to find a lot of this really rather odd. Alien. Alien, yeah. Um, it's not going to appeal to them as being something that they're familiar with in terms of their everyday experiences. But he also tells them that it's important for them to work with uh, those example, uh, exemplars uh, to suspend their disbelief if that is what's necessary uh, because it's all about attuning them with a particular set of skills. Uh, and uh, those skills themselves, he does say in, in the first chapter, are to think like an economist. He also tells them that they might get through all the way to the end of the book before this becomes instinctive for them <laughs> Uh, but this is what uh, he sees the aim of, of engaging uh, starting undergraduate economic students is, uh, to get them to think differently. About his bending the mind or, or, or altering the mind, 
uh, from an intuitive state and possibly an open mind, uh, an inquiring mind, to a closed, set, and prescribed state. Uh, dangerous, is it not? Well, from the 1940s onwards, um, an era that Mark Blaug has called uh, the formalist revolution, um, formalism being um, the willingness to try to reduce everything to a workable and mathematically tractable model. Um, from that time onwards, the aim has really not been to talk about intuitions at all. Intuitions are a, um, are, are a corrupting uh, influence. Um, and how do you... Uh, how do you model something as hit and miss as an, as an intuition? And so the interesting thing there is that there is a move away um, from um, what economists in the 1930s and the 1940s increasingly came to see as um, the metaphysical baggage that, that so much of previous economics had allowed itself to carry. Yes. Um, so to rid it uh, of all of those elements uh, that were to do with um, prior forms of socialization um, to deliver something that could genuinely be seen as scientific that could be that could lead to a series of equations that were manipulable in mm. the same way as scientific mm, equations mm, are mm, mm, mm. Uh, to talk about uh, order uh, an order in that scientific sense um, and after order comes prediction so all of these elements of the formalist revolution were about taking away the whole structure uh, of intuition, learned intuition, um, saying that that was economically both non-viable and non-helpful, but then to do that, of course, means implanting those students with another set of learned intuitions. Mm. Um, so the assumptions themselves, taken in the name of, of formal rigour, taken in the name of science, are nothing other than a, a different set um, of learned intuition. So, so it's replacement, not eradication. Last question. Um, how did you escape? Because you've obviously been through academia, you work in academia. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the courses that you teach, you teach um, in, in, in the way that you feel they should be taught. But how, how, did, you, how did you not yield to the, the kind of m m brainwashing? I, I don't really want to say brainwashing because it sounds conspiratorial, but how was your mind not bent in the same way as a lot of these other guys have been? The flippant answer maybe is I was never made to read Man Q. Um, the less flippant answer was that even if I had have been, I would still never have believed it. I would still... But why? I, I, I can point to any number of the uh, teachers that I had at university uh, and they didn't believe it either. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that really stuck in my mind was the difference between those that didn't believe it but still played the professional game, game yeah. uh, and those that didn't believe it and were trying to alert us to the possibility that even though this is what the model says, uh, don't believe that this model replicates anything that you might find out there uh, in the in real, the real world. world. Um, so I think that I was maybe very fortunate in the way that I was taught economics. I was taught it in a much more heterodox manner than would have been the case um, had, um, had there been rather different people um, doing the majority of the teaching in that department at the time. Um, so I'm always grateful for that. Um, I think I just understood uh, the whole point of economics in a different way to, to the textbooks though, because the textbooks still do ram into you time and time again that this is a, this is a way of thinking. Um, economics is method uh, and I was always much more interested in economics as subject matter when I teach political economy to my students um, it, it immediately escapes uh, that notion of having to think like an economist uh, some of the students will come from an economics background as part of an escape route that they have in mind um, and they're always some of the most interesting students to teach because you see them trying to shed themselves of, that. of assumptions. Yeah. And they, they see those assumptions coming, coming through in the language that they use to try to engage other students in, in debate and discussion. Uh, they also see it coming through uh, when they're asked to write an essay uh, and they have to try to work out, well, what does an essay look like? Where do I start? Where's my model? 
Um, so I, I have a lot of those students um, who are in it for the intellectual journey, I think, an intellectual journey away from economics. Um, my own students that haven't had any of that, that background, most of them will have a background either in politics or uh, possibly in history. Um, and so it's easy to teach uh, political economy as a historically based uh, subject matter to those students uh, because it, it probably already uh, resonates with what they think is the most important aspect of it anyway. Fantastic. Matthew, thank you very much for coming, making a trip down from Warwick on, uh, on this uh, fantastic summer that we've got. Um, and, and thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. That's it uh, this week. Um, welcome to summer, or as we call it, the ARC. Uh, and that's it uh, from the Renegade Economist. Bye-bye.